Sit in New York Airport. Not the most pleasant way to spend an evening, Max thought Trond, watching the boarding process for what he hoped would be his flight home to Charlotte. Max, along with his two sisters, owned a small pharmaceutical company created by their father several decades earlier. His father developed a series of valuable but rarely used drugs that made the company profitable but never offered much room for growth. His parents had passed away, and Max had spent the last few days in New York negotiating the sale of the company to a major pharmaceutical concern. Max and his team of lawyers and brokers closed the deal today and left it to the lawyers to complete the paperwork. Max hoped he would make it home tonight, but it looked doubtful. The last flight of the day to Charlotte was fully booked, and he was third on the wait list. He didn't call his wife Camilla because he didn't know what to tell her. He sat at the bar where he could watch the gate and drank his second gin and tonic, thinking about the deal and the money he and his sisters would share. Something over $10 million for him, plus a well-compensated transition period with Big Pharma, meant a new lifestyle for him and Camille. Their twin girls were already out of the nest, or at least on their way. Both were in college, juniors at Duke, where tuition was eating him alive. But all this will change when the deal with the pharmaceutical company closes. Meanwhile, the boarding process was ending and the agents at the gate were ushering the last passengers onto the plane. And then a small miracle happened. The boarding sign changed and Max saw that his name appeared on the waiting list. He threw the money on the bar, waved to the bartender who gave him a thumbs up, grabbed his briefcase and duffel bag, and ran for the exit. The agent at the gate handed him his boarding pass and quickly explained to him and two other passengers that the group of four who had checked in remotely had not shown up, so they were given seats. Max ran down the plane with his new buddies, and when he got to the gate, he realized he had a first-class seat. A good sign, he thought. I got on the fleet. I'm sitting in first class. Home a day early. This may mean that the pharmaceutical deal will indeed close. The boarding door closed as he boarded, and the flight attendant asked if he wanted something to drink as they taxied to the runway. He felt like he'd earned another drink, so he drank another GMT and then fell asleep dreaming of a future for him and Camilla with enough money to always fly first class. The shock of landing woke him up. He eventually made it to the taxi stand to take a taxi home. He had driven his pickup truck to the airport a few days earlier. But now he was exhausted, a little drunk, and it was really late, too late to call Camille to come get him. They lived a few miles outside of Charlotte so the cab ride was long enough for him to fall asleep again. The driver had to wake him up when they arrived. Max paid him, added a generous tip and a little sluggishly got out of the taxi. It was a long, busy day and evening. He was already thinking about getting cozy in bed with Camilla when the taxi pulled away and he turned towards the house. What he saw stopped him in his tracks and woke him up completely. A gold Mercedes was parked in the driveway in front of his side of the garage. The car seemed like a very fashionable Mercedes, but then all Mercedes seemed fashionable to him. The house was dark. By then, it was past midnight, and Max just stood there for several minutes. He spoke to Camille from his lawyer's office around noon, and she said nothing about late-night visitors. He tried not to think about the unthinkable tried to create a happy scenario that would allow him to snuggle up to warm, sleepy Camille in just a few minutes. However, his mind didn't work that way, so he slowly walked towards the door in the passage between the garage and the house. He unlocked it, entered the quiet house, and walked even more slowly through the kitchen and up the stairs to his and Camilla's bedroom. The bedroom door was open, apparently not expecting visitors, and Max stepped inside. And then it closed. There was no other way to express it. His brain stopped working. He stopped breathing. Even his heart seemed to stop beating. He saw what he considered unthinkable. Camille slept naked, spread out on her side of the bed, with one arm wrapped around the man who was also sleeping, even smiling slightly in his sleep. Max stood there for what seemed like an eternity, but eventually his brain started working again, 
He looked again at Camilla's hand, lying across the man, and they both snored. This broke Max's heart. Until tonight, he had enjoyed listening to Camille snore. She was snoring quietly, almost purring, Max thought. He thought her snoring meant she felt absolutely safe, deep in the peaceful sleep that came from sharing a bed and life with Max. He often fell asleep with that soft purring sound in his ears. But that's all. He would never hear that snoring again, never sleep next to her again. Even with his heart broken, Max began to think again. He saw the man's clothes neatly folded, lying on the chair that Max had sat on hundreds of times. Smoldering rage began to flare up inside Max. He pulled up his pants and pulled out his wallet and car keys, then stopped to think a little more. He could get the tennis racket out of the bedroom closet and use it to beat the asshole up, he decided. He could also beat Camille. Both of these actions, while satisfying in the short term, could cause big problems for Max in the long term. Another idea began to form in his mind. He took out his cell phone to take some incriminating pictures as the idea germinated and expanded. Max finished taking pictures and then collected all of Asshole's clothes and shoes. The asshole was a big guy. Max was 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighed about 160 pounds. The asshole looked at least 4 or 5 inches taller and perhaps 50 pounds heavier. A tennis racket may not have been a good idea, even in the short term. Taking his clothes and shoes in his hands, Max took one last look at his wife, his loving, beloved wife, the mother of his precious daughters, and hardened his heart against the love that had fueled him for more than 20 years. He left the bedroom, still without tears, and headed back down the stairs to the outside. The key fob beeped, and the Mercedes doors opened. Max put his briefcase and duffel bag inside and slid into the driver's seat. He was never a fan of fancy cars, but when he got into the Benz, he realized that he liked it. He figured out the controls, put the car in gear, and drove off. After about a mile, Max pulled over and looked at Asshole's wallet. The usual things. Some money, business cards that identified Asshole as Franklin Thompson, a senior sales manager at a local Mercedes dealership, a driver's license that showed a Charlotte address. If Asshole had family there, Max figured he could cause some real trouble. For Asshole, of course, and maybe Camille, too. But at the moment, Max was exhausted and headed to the nearest motel to get some sleep. Camilla Tronder was a very careful person. She knew that she was not as smart as her husband Max, but thanks to her caution, her affair with Franklin Thompson lasted almost five months without Max suspecting anything. Max was still in New York, she thought, as she lay in bed with Franklin the next morning. He was good in bed, maybe not as good as Max, but out of bed he could not compete with his husband. Too much like a car salesman, she thought, coming to the conclusion that it was time to end this affair. Franklin was becoming too possessive. He wanted to spend the night with her and she allowed it, but that would be the last time she did that. She planned to spend the rest of her life with Max and have a strange man in their marital bed. Even if Max will never know about it, it was still too disrespectful. She would call Franklin later today and gently but sternly tell him that their affair was over. Then she headed to the shower. Back in the bedroom, she was getting dressed when Franklin returned from the shower with a towel around his waist. He stood there for a moment and then asked, Camilla, where did you take my clothes? What? I didn't move anything anywhere. Where are you all going this evening? I folded it right here, on this chair. But there are no clothes. Did you take her with you to the guest room? She must be here somewhere. Uh, I... He muttered heading back down the hallway to the guest room, and then immediately returned. No, there's nothing there, there's nothing here. His voice trailed off as he tried to comprehend the disappearance of his clothes. Perhaps you left everything downstairs when we came in the evening? Camilla asked a little impatiently, thinking that they had both drunk too much the night before. No, I'm sure I didn't, but I think I'll go take a look, Franklin answered, heading out of the bedroom. He quickly returned, running up the stairs. Camilla, Camilla, my car is not there. My clothes are not downstairs. Someone was here at night, took my clothes and stole my car. 
Ah, damn it, what's going on? I'm sorry, what? Camilla tried to comprehend what Franklin was saying. How could his clothes and car go missing? The two of them stayed in the house all night. Could someone have gotten inside? Suddenly, Camilla collapsed on the bed. It was Franklin's turn to ask, What? What? Camilla tried to formulate a response, but she found it difficult to breathe, let alone speak. Franklin, what if it was Max? She finally said. What if he came home from New York while we were sleeping? What if he took your things and your car? Oh, shit, Franklin said, collapsing on the bed next to Camille. You need to find out where he is. It could be him, but if he's still in New York, that means some kind of burglar has broken in. Which means we need to call the police. I have to get my things and my car back. Oh, damn. This car. If we call the police, they'll want to know who owns it, and it's in my wife's name. For some damn tax reason, I... His voice trailed off as he imagined a future that could range from just bad to completely catastrophic. I'll call his office. His secretary arrives very early, and she must know where he is. Camille took out her phone and dialed Max's office number. Even though it was not yet eight o'clock, Max's secretary answered immediately. Max Tronder's office, may I help you? Hey, Sheila, this is Camille. Uh, I know it's very early, and uh, I'm not sure where Max is. He didn't call last night, so uh, did you hear anything from him? Camilla, it's still early, and I know that the team in New York worked late yesterday. They'll probably start late today. I talked to Max yesterday around 6, just before I went home. He said they were making good progress and might reach a deal today. That's good to hear. So he's still in New York, right? Yes, I'm sure he is. And I expect to hear from him as soon as they all get back to the lawyer's office. Do you want me to ask him to call you? Yes, please but only if he has time. I know how important this deal is. Well done. Bye. They hung up and Camille turned to Franklin. Max is still in New York, so we should probably call 911 and report a break-in and car theft. Camilla, what do we tell them? That your lover had his clothes stolen from your bedroom and his car stolen from your driveway? I mean, what the fuck? We're really screwed here. Okay, okay. I understand. Let's think about it. How about I take you home and leave you there? You dress up and report thefts, as if they happened there. Uh, while your wife was taking the kids to school. And, uh, maybe you don't report stolen clothing. This may be harder to explain than a stolen car. Yes, except that yesterday I told my wife that I was going to Atlanta for a meeting about the new Mercedes S-Class, and I wouldn't be home until noon. Okay but we can wait until maybe noon when you'll be back anyway. You drove home, left your keys in the car because it was a short stop before going to the dealership and your car was stolen while you were at home. You know, I think it might work and I could say I left my wallet in the car and it got stolen too. And we can hang out here for a few hours. Maybe we'll end up needing another shower. Maybe together. Franklin, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I need to call work to take a sick leave. Camille worked as a paralegal in a small law firm. The work was okay, if a bit boring. She went out into the hallway to make a call and returned to the bedroom to find Franklin back in bed. She was tempted, but after thinking about Max and her recent decision to end the affair, she decided to say no. Franklin, she said, without making the slightest move to take off her clothes, I think it's time to end this. We had a good run, but you know it could have been Max last night. We're lucky it was actually a bad guy. Let's find some clothes and maybe go to some place to eat for breakfast. Franklin looked at her, thought about trying to convince her, but in the end, he realized that she was right. They were lucky, but they shouldn't go too far. Yes. And with an inner smile, he remembered that another attractive middle-aged mother often came to the car dealership. Okay, I agree. It was a good run. So, how about some clothes? It turned out to be not so simple. Franklin was 50 pounds heavier and four inches taller than Max. Camille finally found a pair of tattered old sweatpants that seemed to fit Franklin after making a few V-cuts at the waist. She then tied some strings around his waist to hold up his sweatpants. 
She also found a sweatshirt that had turned pink when it was sloppily washed in the washing machine. She trimmed the sleeves and cut some more at the armholes, and Franklin had his outfit. She wanted to make a comment about the clown's clothes, but she just smiled slightly when she saw his face. They decided to watch TV until it was time to go to Franklin's house. Earlier that morning, around the time Franklin discovered his clothes and car were missing, Max pulled into the driveway of the address listed on Franklin's driver's license. There's a nice house, a small bicycle leaning against the wall of the garage. Max sat in the car for a while, thinking, wondering, but still without tears. His night at the motel passed quickly, and he didn't go out for a run until dawn. He was surprised that he didn't feel worse. Perhaps he was still in shock. He walked to the front door, taking out Franklin's wallet with his driver's license, rang the bell, and a young woman who looked to be in her twenties, attractive, but a little frazzled, opened the door. Max was wearing a suit that he had bought the day before in New York, a white shirt that now looked rumpled and no tie. He didn't look his best, but he hoped he didn't look threatening. He held up Franklin's driver's license so the woman could see it and pointed at the gold Mercedes. Before he could say anything, the woman slammed the door in his face, but then opened it again a few seconds later, holding her cell phone in her hand. I have 911 on my phone, and I'm ready to press send if you don't tell me my husband is okay. Ma'am, I have a photo on my phone of your husband and my wife in bed at night, naked and fast asleep. To be honest, I don't think there's anything wrong with your husband or with my wife either. If you want to call 911, call 911, and I'll just wait in the car. They looked at each other for a moment until her face fell, and she opened the door to let him in. She started to say something when they both heard Mommy from the kitchen. Wait here, I'll be right back. She turned away, heading back to what Max assumed was the kitchen. He heard voices, hers, and at least one of the children. She returned, handing him a cup of coffee. I hope you drink black coffee. I have to get the kids ready for school and then take them. I'm afraid I trust you more than my husband now. You can stay here until I get back, and then we can talk. Fine? Okay, Max answered. I'm afraid we're in the same boat. He sat down in the living room, and soon a woman appeared with two children. She introduced him as Dad's friend and walked out the door with them. Max just sat there, drank some not-so-good coffee, thought about calling his office, but ended up just sitting there. When the woman returned, she silently ran up the stairs to the living room. A few minutes later, she came back down, looking better with her hair combed and her lips a little tinted. She extended her hand to Max. As they shook hands, she introduced herself. Sorry for the recent commotion. I am Molly Thompson, currently married to Franklin Thompson, who is currently involved with the woman you are currently married to. Max couldn't help but laugh at her turn of phrase, and it felt good to laugh. You are absolutely right about all the current events at the moment. My name is Max Tronder, and my wife's current name is Camilla Tronder. He then explained what happened last night and saw Molly's tears begin to flow. I'm divorcing Camilla, and I'm sure the photographs will help me get a decent settlement. I can send them to your phone if you think you might need them. Yes, I think I should have them, Molly answered, looking at Max with dead eyes. He reached for his phone but stopped when she said, Wait, don't send them to me. If I see them, I will never get those pictures out of my head. You keep them, and if I need them, I can call you. Right? Of course, Max said, but then added, I probably won't be at my current job for long, and I definitely won't be in my current house anymore. I will give you the contact details of my lawyer. You can always contact him if you need photography or any help in a divorce situation. Okay, thank you, Molly said. But what should we do right now? Are you returning the car? Are you going to wait for Franklin and try to beat him up? You've seen him. He's a pretty big guy, even though he's put on a little weight. Yesterday, he was supposed to be in Atlanta for some car meeting and stay there overnight. He should be home this afternoon. You know, I kind of like this car, and I've never driven a Mercedes before. I think I'll keep it until someone forces me to return it. Your husband, and I must say his name to me is Asshole, may have... Molly laughed and then Max joined in. 
both of them needing all the release they could find. Actually, the car is registered in my name, Molly said. For some tax reason, I think more depreciation Franklin, or should I say asshole, put it in my name since I drive more than he does. And she paused thoughtfully, then continued, You know, since I own this car, I can issue you a permit to drive, and the cops can call me to confirm if you get pulled over. Max liked the idea, but didn't respond, since Molly was obviously still working out the plan. And one more thing, she said. There have been a lot of break-ins in our area lately. You have Franklin's keys and clothes. If the key we're hiding in the backyard is missing when he gets here, he might try to break in. And if our security system is set to instant alert mode, he will attract interesting attention from the police. Molly, I think I'm falling in love again. You are wonderful. Okay, okay, calm down. Franklin can just wait to come back until the kids and I get home from school this afternoon, but I can pick them up and go to the park for a while. Let's give him more time to get into even more trouble. Whatever happens, please let me know, especially if he does get into trouble with the police. And call me when you need your car back. I don't want you to get into any trouble. We'll be done. Now you need to get out of here. And so do I. Max drove off in a beautiful gold Mercedes wondering how much the same one, only in a better color, would cost. Molly gave him the permission slip and he assumed she would get the hidden key, set the alarm, and leave for the rest of the day. Camille and Franklin actually arrived at Franklin's house around noon. Camilla dropped him off and quickly rushed off as if she was trying to avoid further infection. Franklin walked to his front door, hoping that it might not be locked because Molly was home. But at the same time, afraid that she might be there. Of course it was locked, and he hurried around the house to the rock in the backyard, where they kept the spare key. But the stone disappeared. Oh shit, he muttered, looking at the back of his house, wondering if he should break in. He tried to open the back door, but it was also locked, so he decided that he really had no choice but to force his way inside. He looked at the windows along the back wall, Wondering which one would be best to break, he stopped at the window into the family room. The window was the largest at the back, and breaking it would give him more room to enter the house. He broke a branch from the tree he was about to trim and examined the window. Since he was barefoot, he needed a way to get through the broken window glass, which he could break. He pulled two chairs from the back porch and placed them next to the window. He thought he could climb over the chairs to avoid the glass and then just be careful when he entered the living room. A few deep breaths, and he was ready to go. Franklin threw a branch through the family room window and it shattered with a satisfying crack. Followed immediately, unfortunately for Franklin, by the wailing sound of the home alarm system siren. To make things even more unfortunate, the police car just happened to be driving down his street as Molly had called the local police station that morning to complain about potential break-ins in their area. Damn, 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 Franklin muttered, trying to quickly climb over the chairs to get into the house and disable the damn security system, but not fast enough. Police, stop right there and slowly walk away from the house. Raise your hands up. Franklin looked back and saw two policemen with pistols. He did as he was told, and only cut his legs slightly as he climbed off the chairs and backed away. Officers, I can explain, he began to say when one of the policemen put his hands behind his back and handcuffed him. The policeman ignored his attempt to explain himself and read out his rights. The policeman then asked if he wanted to say anything. Yes, yes, this is my house and I, uh, don't have a key, so I broke in to get some clothes and call my office. The cops were looking at Franklin's tracksuit, perhaps thinking clown clothes, when one of them asked him if he had any identification. Uh-uh, no, no, not now. You see, I lost my car and all my clothes and stuff, and I just need to get inside so I can get some real clothes. How did you lose your car, sir? Uh, well, last night I stayed at a friend's house, and this morning the car, uh, wasn't there. It just wasn't, huh? Have you reported a mysterious disappearance? Maybe you left it in a bar somewhere? Franklin was stumped. He didn't want to reveal where he was or why he didn't report the car missing, but he also didn't want to go to jail for trying to break into his own home. 
and the handcuffs were really uncomfortable. Then he came up with a solution that might work. You can call my wife. She can identify me. And perhaps you could take me to my office. I can ask someone there to help me get some clothes. He knew he'd put up with a lot of crap at the dealership, but it was a lot better than going to jail. One of the cops took Molly's phone number from Franklin and went to call her. Franklin could hear the police part of the conversation. Ma'am, this is Riles from the Charlotte Police Department. We are at the address, he gave the address. And we have a man here who claims to be your husband. He tried to break into your house because he lost his clothes and... Yes, ma'am? No, ma'am? Uh, yes, ma'am. We will, of course, do this. Thank you, ma'am. He turned back to Franklin. The lady says her husband is in Atlanta and anyone who breaks into her house must be a burglar. She hopes we throw you in jail and throw away the key. But, but... Franklin was almost crying as the cops led him to their patrol car to take him to the station. And Camilla. She arrived at her office half a day late, but she will make up for lost time. Still thinking about Max, since she still hadn't heard from him, she called his cell phone, but no one answered. She then called his office again. Hello, Sheila. Camilla again. I'm starting to get a little worried about Max since I still haven't heard anything from him. And you? No, I have nothing new. I guess this means he's still in New York with the lawyers, but it's really not like him to not call. You do seem a little worried, so I'll call there and check on him, and either he or I will call you back in a few minutes. Fine? Thank you, Sheila. You are the best secretary in the world. A few minutes later, Camilla actually received a call back. Camilla, this is Sheila. I talked to one of the secretaries at the law office, and she said Max left late yesterday, hoping to catch the last flight to Charlotte. So I called Max on his cell phone to check on him. I did talk to him, and he asked me to tell him that he would call later. Fine. Thank you, Sheila. Uh, thank you, Camille said, disconnected. A snake began to grow in the depths of her stomach. Max hung up after talking to Sheila. He was driving a gold Mercedes to see a divorce lawyer recommended by Fred Thomas, his longtime business lawyer. He trusted his business lawyer and hoped he could trust his divorce lawyer. Mr. Thronder, please take a seat. Miss Reinhardt will be with you in a minute, the secretary told him. He sat down, somewhat reassured by the lawyer's office. No expensive furniture, but not cheap-looking either. Before he had time to worry further, a 50-year-old, somewhat plump lady with obviously dyed red hair entered the waiting room. Mr. Thronder? Max stood up and nodded, and she continued, I'm Anna Reinhardt. Fred called and told me to take the best possible care of you. Let's go into my office and talk about your situation. Max followed her into a nice but not luxurious office, took coffee from the secretary and told his story. He found a cheating wife, wanted a divorce, and also wanted to protect his assets, especially the proceeds from the sale of his company and his sister's company. He skipped the part of the story that concerned the golden Mercedes, although he suspected that Anna might find it funny. Max, is it okay if I call you that? He nodded, and she continued. And I'm Anna. Good news. Well, relatively good news considering your situation. Fred told me that you and your sisters owned your company before you married your wife, so your shares are considered separate property. That is, your wife has no rights to the shares of your company or to the proceeds of the sale. But you need to keep the shares and sale proceeds separate from any joint account you and your wife may have. This is true? I think so. But what about our house, retirement accounts, and the like? Well, there's not such good news for you. Since your salary is much higher than hers, you will be paying some child support for several years. We can probably avoid paying anything into the retirement account by increasing the amount of alimony. I know it's not attractive, but the short-term pain avoids what's usually worse, having to share your retirement money decades in the future. And your kids are in college, so no child support. I assume you don't mind being on the hook for the rest of their college expenses? Yes, that's suitable. What about the house? You and your wife must decide what you want. You may decide to sell it and split the proceeds, or one of you can buy the other's portion based on the current appraised value. 
After what I saw last night, I definitely don't want this house. I don't think Camilla can afford to buy my half, so I guess that means selling. Okay, I can do the paperwork this way. The divorce petition is a pretty standard form, so I can have it ready for you tomorrow, early if you'd like, so we can serve it to her tomorrow afternoon. A proposed settlement could then follow next week. God, that's pretty fast. Um, I... Mr. Thronder, Max, listen to me. If there's a chance for you and your wife that some counseling or just a little time could... No. No, actually, it's just a shock for me. I mean, less than 24 hours ago, I was happy. I couldn't wait to get home to my wife and tell her the good news about the sale of the company. And now I'm sitting here talking about filing for divorce, but we must move forward. I'll figure out how to deal with this. Okay, but if you change your mind, just call me and we can work things out. Max thanked her paid the advance, and left the office. He walked back to the gold Mercedes, wondering a bit about what was going on with that asshole he'd seen last night. And that reminded him that he had told his secretary that he would call Camille. Camille answered the phone in her office at the law firm where she worked. Camilla, this is Max. You called and looked for me. Oh, Max, thanks for calling. Um, I missed you. You, uh, where are you? I'm here in Charlotte, Camille. Um, when did you get back? The snake deep in her belly raised its head. Last night, Camilla, I came back last night. And the snake bit. A little harsh. Camilla leaned back in her chair. She knew she had to carry on this conversation, but she could barely breathe, let alone speak. Camilla, I'm hanging up now. No, Max, no, she managed to squeeze out. Please, please, can we meet somewhere? I need to see you and just see you for a few minutes. Max hesitated. This woman was his love, the mother of his daughters, the most important person in his life for over 20 years. Okay, Camilla, the center cafe is at six. The snake bit even harder. Camilla had to agree, but the center cafe was the place where she and Max had met a long time ago, both of them hanging out with friends. Since then, this cafe had become a special place for them, and now she was afraid why Max had suggested this, but she had to say yes. Max, I'll see you there, and please listen. I'm sorry, and I love you. Max hung up. Camilla sat and cried, and the snake bit more and more. Camilla came to the cafe early. Max was not there yet. She ordered a glass of wine and sat there thinking about what a terrible person she was. Her first real sexual experiences were with big, strong football players in college. She played around in high school, but it took those college football players holding her down, making her feel helpless. When Max arrived, she thought she had overcome this need to feel helpless. Max was everything she needed. Strong in bed, loving, a great father to the girls, a good provider. That would have been enough if it weren't for the plane ride back to Charlotte from the West Coast. Max was visiting some pharmaceutical company trying to sell a new drug, and she accompanied him for the weekend before his meetings began. Flying home alone on an overnight flight, she sat next to a large man, the coach of what turned out to be a local NFL team. They chatted, drank too much, and she fell asleep with her head on his shoulder. She woke up with his hand between her legs, under her skirt. Now, thinking about that night, she knew she should have screamed or at least pushed his hand away. But no, Camilla didn't do that. And the feeling of guilt? She didn't remember feeling guilty, only relief that Max didn't return until later that week when she and her body had recovered. The pussy had a feeling of guilt. This coach only worked in Charlotte for one season, and Camille might have become a faithful wife again if he had not introduced her to a forward from the practice squad before leaving. Not a star, not even a newbie, but just as strong and dominant in bed as the coach was. Camilla was actually grateful when she was assigned. After some time, the guilt finally surfaced. She wanted to remain faithful to Max and broke up with her lover. Camille thought she was done with her cheating by the time their girls left for college. She loved Max dearly and enjoyed the extra time they had together when the girls were away. But the snake slithered in when Max did something nice for it. He told her it was time for her to get a new car, 
a luxury car that she should choose, and unfortunately, she decided to go to the Mercedes dealership, where she met Franklin Thompson. He didn't sell her a Mercedes, but he pushed all the right buttons to get her into bed, and she knew it was wrong. Wrong. Also because Franklin wasn't that good in bed. She had gotten away with her previous affairs and thought the marriage was intact. But now she and Max loved each other more than ever, and she wanted to be faithful. This was the right thing, and not have sex with a big idiot. Letting Franklin spend the night in his marital bed would have been a terrible mistake, even if Max hadn't discovered them. But she had let him, and now she feared the terrible price she might have to pay. Hello, Camilla. Camille looked up and saw Max standing there. He looked much older than he did before he flew to New York, and she knew it was her fault. The snake in her stomach continued to bite. Hi, Max. Thank you for being here. I don't even know how to begin to say how sorry I am. Can I ask a few questions? He said, sitting down. Oh, Max, please no. If we have any chance, questions and answers will simply kill that chance. Max, we should run away, just for a few days, to some island in the Caribbean, where we can be reunited, where we can hug each other, where... Camilla, please, you're delusional. If you can't answer my questions, I'll get up and leave now. The snake continued to bite, but Camille knew she had to endure the pain and let Max vent the way he wanted. Maybe, just maybe, he could come out the other side of his anger to some kind of reconciliation. Okay, Max, ask me anything. Do you know what time I got home last night? Strange question, she thought. Um, no, not really, it had to be after... She shut up. She knew what his next question would be, and it was, And do you know what I saw when I got home? When I went upstairs to our bedroom? Or should I say, what used to be our bedroom? Yes, Max, I know what you must have seen, and I know it must have been one of the worst things you've ever seen in your entire life, and I know it's entirely my fault. That you saw this, and I am begging you to please listen to me. Max, I'm sorry. So sorry that I won't fight the divorce you want. If you want, shut up, Camilla. Next question. How many men have there been since we got married? If you're lying, if I think you're lying, I get up and leave. Camilla's first thought was to lie. The second thought was that lying was too risky. And the third thought was that the marriage was probably over anyway. Three, Max. Three men whom I now regret having ever met. I think I can see in your eyes that our marriage is over, and I understand it. You deserve someone better than me. I'm willing to do almost anything to give us another chance, but I understand if you don't want anything to do with me anymore. Call the lawyer, Camilla. Tomorrow you will be served with divorce papers. Max got up and left. Camille sat there, too stunned to even cry at first. While she was thinking about what Max had just said, the snake in her stomach bit hard, and she actually started crying. Max walked out of the cafe, remembering how he and Camille first met there, decades ago, and wondering if this meeting would be the last time they ever had any kind of intimate conversation. Intimacy, he thought bitterly, must be the worst kind of intimacy, hearing your wife say that she had sex with other men, and to see her with that toad Franklin, in their bed, in their fucking bed, sleeping, her snoring, for God's sake, how am I ever going to get over this? Perhaps he could handle three faceless men in the twenty-odd years they had been together. Just maybe with some counseling and a lot of humiliation on her part, maybe. But he would never get over that scene in their bed. Their marriage was over. And sitting in that damn gold Mercedes, he finally cried. At some point, Max realized that it was already getting dark. He blew his nose, wiped his face, and thought about what Molly Thompson had said that morning, which now seemed like a year ago. She told him not to send her pictures of her husband sleeping with Camilla. She felt that it would be much more difficult to forgive if she were confronted with visual evidence. Max decided to call her, share this thought with her, and check the situation with Mercedes. Hello, Molly answered the call. Molly, this is Max Tronder from this morning. I'm just calling to see how you're doing and what I should do with the car. Max. Thank you for calling. I seem to be holding on. You can keep the car for now. 
Franklin is in so much trouble that he won't need her for a while. Trouble? I hope you didn't shoot him. No, but he might prefer this option. He got arrested for trying to break into our house and apparently took a swing at one of the cops. You know, he's a big guy, and the cop hit him with a stun gun. Then something happened while he was in prison. He doesn't want to talk about it, but I think he may have been attacked by another prisoner somehow. I wouldn't talk to him, and he ended up having to call his brother to post bail, and that means his whole family knows what's going on. Wow. Molly, I can't say I feel sorry for him, but I feel sorry for you. What I really want to say is that you made the absolutely right decision this morning not to look at the pictures of him cheating. If you have any chance of reconciling, these photos would make it a lot harder. Yeah, he finally came home a couple of hours ago, crying and telling me how sorry he was and begging me to let him stay, at least for now. You know, we have two little kids, so I'm going to try to figure this out. But life won't be easy for him. His own brother, who is a lawyer, told me that I should push for a prenuptial agreement, and he said he would help with that. Besides, I'm going to be in control of our finances, at least for a while. Franklin will be on a fairly short leash, and I plan to tug his collar frequently. Keep it up, Molly. I wish you all the best, and when you need to return the car, just call me. They hung up, and Max sat there, somewhat jealous of Molly. Perhaps Franklin learned his lesson. Being arrested and charged with assault for trying to hit a police officer on top of what happened to him in prison may have scared him a lot. Max hoped so, for the sake of Molly and their children. Finally, he drove back to the motel where he was staying. He had one more job to do before he tried to sleep. Call his daughters, Jane and Joan. Hi, Daddy. It seemed to him that Jane answered. They were twins, not identical, but they might as well have been identical. They sounded alike. They went to a very expensive college together. They studied the same thing. Nursing. At least they didn't look exactly alike. Close and obviously sisters. But not so obvious twins. Max often admitted, but only to himself, that he was happy that they were not identical. They were very good at ganging up on him, and he thought it would be even worse if two identical young women were forcing him to buy a car. Getting him to stay out late asking for money to go to Florida for spring break, which, whatever the request of the day is, Daddy, please. But he also admitted, again, only to himself, that he enjoyed spoiling them. Janie? Yes, you guessed correctly. Of course, there was a 50-50 chance. What's the matter? Listen, tomorrow is Saturday, and I would like to invite you and your sister to have breakfast. Well, let's call it brunch, maybe around 11 or so that bistro on 4th Street we used to go to. Um, that suits me. Wait a second. He heard a noise, and then she came back. And Joan is fine, too. Can we... He quickly interrupted her because six or seven of their friends were present at their last brunch. Let's do this just the three of us, okay? Of course, Jane replied. But tell me what... And again, he interrupted her not wanting to start a conversation on the phone, which was quite difficult, even in person. Listen, I need to run. See you at 11. Love you and tell your sister I love her too. Bye. And he hung up. He hoped she wouldn't call Camilla, but he couldn't tell her that. Then she would have called Camilla immediately. 11 o'clock tomorrow morning will come quickly enough. After Max left the cafe leaving her with his warning or curse or whatever to hire a lawyer. Camille's tears were hard to stop. She knew she had screwed up, had screwed up everything, her marriage, her family, her whole life. She knew that her daughters would find out, her parents would know, all her friends would know. She would probably lose Max and her home. And Max, poor, poor Max, seeing her lying in their bed, naked, probably with that damn Franklin who had a boner. This scene must have nearly killed Max, and Camille's tears continued. Finally, the waitress came over and asked if she needed to go to the ladies' room. Camilla choked back her sobs and managed to say, No, thank you. She paid the bill and left, heading to the house that would soon no longer be her home. When she got there, she found some gin, just the wrong amount, not enough to make her pass out, but too much to help her figure out how to get Max back. 
After she drank it all, it helped her fall asleep, hoping for some miracle that would bring Max back to her. Max was sitting in the bistro at 11 o'clock the next morning when his daughters entered. He reviewed and approved the draft divorce petition early in the morning, then drove two hours from Charlotte, using that time to figure out how and what to say to Jane and Joan. But first, everything is as usual. Hugs and kisses. How is school? How is work? Food ordered and eaten. Pletis cleared. And then, finally, real conversation. Dad, we know something is wrong, Joan began. You look a little sick. Are you here to tell us you have cancer or something? And if so, where is mom? Girls, yes, I have really bad news, but nothing physical. No one is going to die, and... It's mom, Jane interrupted. She did something terrible. Oh, my God. Did she run off with one of her firm's lawyers? A young, strong body that Joni or I should be chasing? Both girls burst out laughing, taken aback by the absurdity of the idea, until they saw that their father was not laughing. Dad... No, no, not mom, no. Joan couldn't finish her fear out loud. Girls, listen to me carefully. Yes, mom changed. She cheated on me, but that doesn't mean she cheated on you girls. Yes, that's right, daddy, Joan said through tears. If her cheating is destroying our family, then yes, she cheated on us just as much as she cheated on you. Both girls cried. And then Max started crying too. The girls stood up and tried to hug their dad and hug each other at the same time. Dad, let's get out of here, Jane said. There's a park about two blocks from here and we'll have more privacy there. People were staring a bit, so Max quickly paid the bill and they walked into the park, a girl on each side of him, all of them holding each other. Tell us, Dad, Jane said after they found a bench to share. We deserve to hear how bad it is. You know she's right. Joan intervened. We are quite mature and can handle this. On the way here, I was racking my brains over what to tell you, Max began. I agree, you are both adults. And yes, you are right. Your mother did cheat on all of us. I'm afraid I found my mother at home in our bed with another man. And she later admitted that there had been other men before him. I think I'm still in a bit of shock, but I know that she and I won't be able to recover from this. I've already talked to a divorce lawyer and mom is getting a divorce petition today. More tears and then finally silence as they all thought about the news and what their future would be like. Girls, no matter how bad it is, you need to put yourself and your schoolwork first. Enough money to pay for your senior year here at Duke. And if either or both of you want to do graduate work, I suspect I can find some money for that too. But there is a quid pro quo here. They looked at him. What did he mean? I'm happy to pay for your education, but I expect you to work hard and get good grades. Yes, what mom did makes it difficult to concentrate on school, but you told me that you are adults, and real adults, mature, disciplined people can handle such adversity. Right? They looked at each other, cried again, and hugged him. Yes, yes, Daddy, you are the best, and we absolutely, positively will not let you down. Joan encouraged him while Jane looked thoughtful. Dad, Joan is right. We won't let you down. But what about you? Will you be okay? What are you going to do? Well, you can think about a lot in a two-hour drive. First, I want you both to know that what you said does not surprise me at all. I know you will continue to do well in school, and I will continue to be proud of you. As for me, what my mother did beat me up pretty bad. I could crawl into a hole and just, you know, suffer feel sorry for myself, try to find a way to make peace with your mom. But I realize that this doesn't suit me. I've spent my entire adult life caring for other people. When I started working for my grandparents' company, I took care of them. And then after they left, I took care of my sisters as they owned their shares in the company. And then I took care of my mom. And I took care of you girls. It sounds like I'm complaining, but I'm really not. The company will soon be sold, and this will relieve me of responsibility for my sisters. Camilla left. And you guys, I promise that I will be happy to take care of you, to help you start your adult life. So what? Two home runs out of three, in terms of the women in my life. Not bad at all. That leaves me. And guess what? I look at this whole story with betrayal and divorce, not as the worst thing in my life, but as a chance to start a new life. A whole new life dedicated to caring for one person, 
Me? Fine. Dad? Really? I mean, if you really mean what you say, that's great, Jones said. Jane was a little more skeptical. Dad, what does all this really mean? New life? What? Work for another pharmaceutical company? Are you buying a farm? What? Good question, and I really have a good answer. No details yet, but this new life will be physical. I'm going to run marathons, climb mountains, swim across the Atlantic, climb the Alps, go on safari. I have a million things I'm going to do. And guess what? While I'm doing these things, I might meet a nice woman doing the same thing. And who knows? Damn it, Dad, this... this is amazing. Both girls looked at him with their mouths open. This was their father, not some enterprising stallion. Did you really come up with all this while driving here from Charlotte? Asked Jane. Well, yes, partly, but besides, I didn't sleep much, and different ideas were spinning in my head. I mean, I could start drinking and feeling sorry for myself, but instead, I'm going to make the best of this mess. Trust me, I'll be fine. Max left his girls with more hugs and kisses and tears as he headed back to Charlotte, still in the gold Mercedes. As soon as Max left, the girls called their mother on the phone. Hello? A creaky voice answered the phone in the Tronder's house. Joan put her phone on speaker. Mom, this is Joan and Jane. We had just had breakfast with Dad, and he told us some terrible news. What, uh, what did he say? Well, divorce was a terrible word, and the reason was your betrayal. Dad gave us a little more detail, but that's basically it. This is true? Oh, girls, this is difficult. He and I have been married for a long time, and this, this, uh, well, this, uh, mistake. Yes, I made a big mistake. Well, more than one, actually. But I'm sure we can get through it. I just need to give your father some time to... Mom, Joan interrupted. Listen. Dad said divorce. He didn't talk about fixing the error. Mom, he was talking about cheating. Well, yes, technically he's right. But that doesn't mean we can't fix it. I told him I would do anything. Mom! It was Jane's turn to interrupt. I think you're delusional. He told us that he had already met with a divorce lawyer. He actually said there was no turning back for you two. Joan and I don't want to take sides, but you have to understand reality. Tormented breathing on the other end of the line. Joan and Jane looked at each other. Should they have gone to Charlotte? Finally, Camilla spoke, not much louder than a whisper. I know, I know, I know I screwed up and ruined my marriage. I think your father hates me, and he's right. I've done disgusting things. He told me to hire a lawyer, and he was right about that too. I'm sorry, girls. I know it's terrible for you too. Mom, don't worry about us, Joan said. Everything will be fine with us, and I know that Dad is doing everything in his power. You need to take care of yourself. Hiring a lawyer sounds like a good idea. Jane and I can go to Charlotte if you need it. Thank you, girls. This is nice. I'll be okay. I just need some time to get used to what I did. They hung up. The girls still didn't know what to do. You know, Joan said, it's funny, although it's not funny, but we're more worried about Mom, who created all this mess, than about Dad. They talked some more, eventually deciding not to go home, but to let their parents deal with each other without their daughters interfering. Camilla sat in her home in Charlotte, a little hungover from the ginch had drunk the night before and more than a little depressed after talking to her daughters. She knew she had to get up, get dressed, and leave the house. Do something, she thought. As her thoughts turned to perhaps buying some more gin, the doorbell rang. Camilla opened the door. A young woman stood on the threshold. She looked like she was chewing gum. Can I help you? Camilla asked. Yes, ma'am. Are you Camilla Tronder, Max Tronder's wife? Why, yes, it's me. Why are you asking? Ma'am, you have been served, the woman said, handing Camille a folder with documents and taking photographs. What? What? Camille asked as the woman walked back to her car. Camille returned to the house and sat down at the kitchen table to look at the mysterious folder. When she saw the title of the first document, she almost fainted. A petition for divorce. She remembered Max's last words to her. Get a lawyer. As she sat there looking at the familiar kitchen she had enjoyed with Max, 
She knew the happy days wouldn't come back after what she had done. Camilla was right. She and Max did not return after her betrayal. Six years later, sitting in the ballroom of an expensive hotel and watching Jane dance with her new husband, Camilla mentally plunged into the past. When the girls were teenagers, she thought life was terrible. Too many activities, too much teenage angst because too many boys were either too mean or, from Camille's point of view, too nice to the girls. Max was too busy with her assistant job. And lawyer is too boring. Life had been overwhelming then, but now she missed it terribly. She was still working at the same law firm, doing the same boring paperwork. She dreamed. Camilla, here is your wine. Camille looked at her beau, the perfectly sweet middle-aged, paunchy, balding lawyer who had escorted her to Janie's wedding and reception. The bride looks lovely, just like her mother. Thank you, Carl. You're sweet, and thanks for the wine. He was a sweet man, and she could imagine marrying him if he was interested, but he definitely wasn't Max. She couldn't help but look across the room at Max. Max had just returned from a mountaineering trip to Nepal, and Camilla thought he looked like one of those bronze Greek god statues. Tanned, incredibly fit, even more handsome than she remembered. Right now he was smiling and laughing with Joan and her boyfriend, holding hands with a woman as beautiful and as fit as Max. Joan told her that Max had met the woman on another mountaineering trip, somewhere in South America, and they had been traveling, sailing, and climbing together for several months. Camille felt sick just thinking about it. Camilla! Carl tried to attract her attention. Yes, Carl? Camilla, I think we should leave. You fulfilled your duties as mother of the bride, and staying here drooling over your ex-husband isn't doing you any favors, and I dare say this is not very good for the relationship that we have with you. Carl, you're sweet, and you're absolutely right. Let me go say goodbye to my daughters and we'll be out of here. Camilla hugged and kissed her daughters, wished the newlyweds all the best, and, as hard as it was for her, ignored Max and his too cute girlfriend. Max actually saw Camille as she left the hall and felt a slight pang of sadness for their old times together. While he was watching her, Joan asked him a question. Sorry, Joni, what were you saying? Daddy, remember that strange-looking gold Mercedes you were driving when you, Jane, and I had breakfast that morning when you came to visit us at Duke? What happened to that car? Ah, Joni, that's a whole story that I won't bore you with. Let me just say that I borrowed this weird gold Mercedes from a friend and ended up giving it back to her. I think she sold it. It was truly an unlucky car. And Max turned to his friend to talk about their next trip to the mountains. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.